Welcome everyone. So glad to have you with us today for our webinar. Huge win. Culver City says no to oil and yes to jobs, co-hosted by the Sierra Club and the Climate Center. We're delighted to have you with us today. As a brief introduction to the Climate Center, for those of you who are new to us, our mission is speed and scale greenhouse gas reductions. We work throughout California. We are probably best known for the key role that we've played in growing community choice energy from about two CCAs five years ago to 21 today that are serving 11 million Californians or about a quarter of the state with 88% clean energy, a great example of speed and scale greenhouse gas reductions. But there's lots more to do as we all know from uh, our September 9th orange sky day, the fires we've experienced, the poor air quality, many of us experience almost every day because of our fossil fuel economy. It's time to change. The nation and the world are looking to us to lead for a climate safe future. Uh, we are pleased that the governor acknowledged in September that we're in a climate emergency, that we have to assess all of our climate goals and move up those timelines with uh, a new executive order that uh, bans gas powered vehicle sales as of 2035 for cars and light trucks. And we understand that he just announced a new executive order related to biodiversity and natural working lands. I haven't actually reviewed that yet myself, but we look forward to seeing that. And we're glad that climate change is front and center for the governor. We know that, however, there's a lot more to do. Um, we invite you today to endorse Climate Safe California. It's to accelerate existing state goals based on the science and the rapidly worsening climate reality globally. We want to have 80% below 1990 greenhouse gas levels, not by 2050, that's just too late. We wanna move that up to 2030 and we wanna to get to net negative emissions or sequestration drawdown from the atmosphere greater than what we are admitting by 2030. We can't wait till 2045 for that. You can endorse that at climatesafeca.org. Two key principles for this are ensuring a just transition for workers who are dependent on fossil fuel enterprises and working with the building construction and other trades so we can solve climate change together. And we're gonna hear more about this in our webinar today. And we have to close the climate justice gap. We have to ensure, <clears throat> excuse me, that lower income communities are no longer disproportionately harmed by fossil fuel development, production and use. We strongly believe that climate justice is racial justice, and we have to ensure that everyone can participate in the clean energy economy. Key policies to reach this are accelerating the phase out of fossil fuel development, production and use, increasing sequestration, investing in community resilience, and putting the billions of dollars needed into climate action every year. So please join us. We hope we'll get 25 endorsements today. You can go to climatesafeca.org. It's a public pledge of support for California to accelerate aggressive, equitable climate policy, inspiring states and countries to greater action for a climate safe future. I wanna thank so much the Sierra Club and especially Monica Embry and David Hockey who are participating in today's effort and have been part of the organizing for this. Our promotional partners, Center for Biological Diversity Action Fund, elected officials to protect America, Food and Water Action, and the LA League of Conservation Voters, and NRDC for being our partners in this. And also thank our staff who brought this together today, Stacy Meinzen, Ann Hancock, and Nina Turner, as well as other members of the Climate Center. I also wanna thank all the members of our wonderful panel today. And it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, of today's webinar, Dr. David Hockey. Uh, David chairs the Clean Break team at the Angeles chapter of the Sierra Club. Clean Break advocates for a just transition from dirty fossil fuels to clean renewable energy and has been working to address the hazards of urban oil production in the LA area for almost 10 years. David is a physician at the Greater Los Angeles Veterans Affair Healthcare System and a health sciences clinical professor at the UCLA School of Medicine. I'm gonna hand it over to you, David, welcome. Thanks, Ellie. Um, very kind introduction. I'm really thrilled to be here today. Um, like LA, Ellie, I'd like to extend a huge thanks to our speakers. Uh, we have a great lineup of all-star speakers and also really welcome all of the folks in the audience who've taken the time to help us celebrate Culver City's recent success securing a plan to phase out oil operations in the city 
including a just transition for oil workers through oil well remediation jobs. So that's why our webinar's title today is Culver City says no to oil, yes to jobs. So by way of background, um, folks need to understand that for, for 100 years, people in the Culver City area have been exposed to the hazards of living near an active oil field, suffering frequent spills and leaks and evacuations and severe health impacts. Uh, we're talking here about the Inglewood oil field, which is the largest urban oil field in the country, with more than a million people living within five miles of the site. Uh, many of these people are disadvantaged communities and people of color. We know how incredibly important Culver City's victory is, considering the overwhelming scientific evidence linking exposure to toxic chemicals from oil operations to health impacts, including heart and lung disease, birth defects, and cancer, not to mention the effects on climate change that you were just talking about, Ellie. So, uh, you know, others have, have been working on this. Uh, California Assembly Bill AB 345 tried to establish a 2,500 foot health and safety buffer for the state of California. And, and Ventura County, as you'll hear, uh, recently established such a setback for their county general plan. But Culver City is on track to become the first city to entirely phase out oil operations in their part of the Inglewood oil field. And in the process, not killing jobs, but creating jobs. And that is why our celebration today is entitled, Culver City Says No to Oil, Yes to Jobs. So um, just a reminder to our audience, um, you will be able to submit uh, questions uh, during this entire webinar by clicking on the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to those questions later on um, in the presentation. So our first speaker is the current Culver City City Council member and former mayor, Megan Solly Wells. Among her many achievements, she led the way for Culver City to become a 100% renewable energy city. She committed the city to 100% electric bus fleet by 2028 and has been spearheading efforts to phase out oil drilling in the Inglewood oil field. So congratulations, council member. We're so happy to be able to celebrate this no to oil, yes to jobs victory with you today. So please help us understand the context. What's the role of the city council and public been, and, and what's left to be done? Thank you so much, David, and thank you to the Climate Center and all uh, our, our partners that are here today. I, I see we're at over like 108 participants, so I'm so happy to have so many par people participating in this. Um, and I'm super proud to be one step closer to realizing a, a long held community vision in Culver City, and that is to make the largest urban oil field in the United States into the Central Park of the West. Um, the, as, as David has said, uh, the Inglewood oil field is nearly 100 years old and it really shows the signs of its age. Over the years, we've had leaks, noxious releases, failures of critical infrastructure, in addition to the ongoing everyday pollution from oil extraction, which continues to put our community at risk. So when I ran for city council and won my seat in 2012, um, I've been pretty laser focused on keeping my community safe, which means serving on the oil drilling subcommittee my entire time in office. Um, we've been working extremely hard to phase out oil drilling in Culver City. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of context here. Um, Culver City has 10% of the Inglewood oil field. That's about 88 acre, acres. The rest of the field is in unincorporated LA County, 
uh, which is basically controlled by the county supervisors. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from uh, our, my wonderful senator and friend, um, Holly Mitchell, uh, who's going to uh, join us in a couple of minutes. Um, she's actually running for the supervisorial seat that is in charge of the remaining 90% of the field. Um, and it was really great when uh, Culver City, we had our, our recent vote that we had her support in, in these efforts. Um, I'll tell you, back in the beginning when I started working on this, we, the Culver City was focused on regulations. We were really focused on getting better regulations than the kind of old ones that are in place um, in Culver City and, and definitely better than the ones that, uh, uh, are, that the county has uh, because they just don't go far enough to protect people and the environment. And in this process, over years of doing comprehensive community outreach, doing, you know, really a deep dive into the environmental consequences of any drilling, um, it became really clear both to the community and to me <laughs> that, you know, just doing better drilling isn't enough what the community was looking for isn't read better regulations. They're looking at uh, the core issue, which is the fact that the oil field, any oil field is the worst possible neighbor you could ever have. <laughs> it's an intensive industrial, uh, uses intens intensive industrial practices that are just simply not compatible with our surroundings. Um, and whatever way you look at it, either from the short term immediate health effects or the long term climate effects, it's just not good for our community. And so our community has spoken out and I just, you know, the, the advocacy and ad activism uh, and, and grassroots community organizing that uh, the Sierra Club has done, led by David, and, and a lot of uh, wonderful partners, um, we were able to uh, not only face the facts that the economic benefits are not even remotely close to outweighing the ne negative impacts of, of oil drilling, but that uh, we could do better. And, um, and so uh, we actually reversed course. We, we had regulations kind of set up to be uh, adopted and we took another path. Um, we, you know, as we were doing our research, we looked at cities such as Goleta and Goleta had a very interesting approach to analyzing, you know, a possible way that um, fossil fuel activity could be phased out. They were using a, an amortization study. And an amortization study is really just looking at, you know, have you, ha, do you, have you reached ROI, your return on investment, right? The, the capital money that you've put in to your business, have you gotten your return on the investment um, so that you can maybe move on and do something else? You know, the fact of the matter is that cities have land use authority. That's like the big power that, that cities actually um, have. Um, and in our case, um, the oil field is, if, if you're a planning wonk, <laughs> it's an existing non-conforming use. So per our zoning laws, um, that means that that land is not designated for that, that use. Um, and what we found is that using uh, in the, amort the initial amortization study that we did, that um, the oil operator will very soon reach its return on investment, possibly it already has. Um, and we actually have the opportunity to phase out this incompatible use and actually use the land for the purposes it's zoned for. And, and mind you, it's not just the city saying like, boom, here's the zoning, <laughs> it is my decree. This is really a community process. And when you change zoning, you go through a really comprehensive uh, community engagement and outreach, et cetera. And so it's really this community vision that is setting what, the, what we use our land for. 
Um, and so Culver City had a very historic vote in August and we decided we would move forward. And I'm just gonna read from our website that kind of cites exactly um, what, what we decided. And if you wanna um, learn more in Culver City, it's, you can go to culvercity.org slash oil and you can see for yourself. Um, so we're going forward with a proposed amortization pro program that resolves the incompatible oil and gas uses and considers options to phase out the non-conforming oil and gas activities within the Inglewood oil field. In addition, the City Council gave direction to look at a just transition for workers, adequate bonding, adequate plug and abandonment pr procedures, complete remediation, thoughtful implementation plan and schedule, outreach to clean energy partners, uh, cost sharing opportunities, and engagement of stakeholders. I know there's a lot to cover and I think we'll be able to hear from our wonderful, fabulous Senator, so I'll leave it over. But, but when we come back to questions, I can tell you a whole lot more about our vote and, and our way forward. And again, thank you for this time. Thank you, Council Member. Um, that was wonderful. Really appreciate your perspectives and, and all the hard work that uh, you and the, and the city have, have put into this effort. Um, I know so much has gone into this. Um, so so I, I believe our Senator is, is uh, online. Thank you. Looks great. Um, and uh, let me do a quick intro. And then uh, uh, again, I just want to thank uh, so much, uh, State Senator Holly J. Mitchell, for making time today to join us. Uh, she's been an environmental justice leader, fighting for an end to fracking, calling for a 2,500 foot setback to separate oil and gas operations from homes and schools. Senator Mitchell is known as the moral compass of the California legislature and is currently chair of the Senate's Budget Committee. Um, thank you, Senator, for being able to join us during your busy schedule. We'd love to hear your perspectives on Culver City's victory and why it's so important to elect climate champions. David, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I am speaking in rather hushed tone. I'm actually in uh, Sacramento today, first time back since we've adjourned session. I'm a member of the Senate's Committee on Pandemic Emergency Response, and we're actually conducted an oversight hearing today and given um, how my district has been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, I thought it was really important for me to continue to stay engaged and actually be present um, to be able to ask questions of um, the Department of Finance and the administration about um, actions they're taking. So thank you. Uh, I'm glad I was able to sign on a moment ago so I could hear um, uh, the forever mayor in my heart and mind and councilwoman <laughs> talk about, um, you know, her commitment when she was first elected, because I think it was her first year when she was elected was maybe the first year uh, that I um, introduced the ban on hydraulic fracturing. Um, encouraged to do so by Culver City activists and residents. Uh, and we went down that journey together, but I was really it helps me just now to hear and fully understand um, the process by which Culver City went through. Uh, I knew about the community engagement, but, but to get from point A to point B, where coming up with regulations for safe drilling just wasn't cutting it. And so I'm so proud of the courageous move both the residents of Culver City um, took in their vote, uh, as well as the leadership of Megan and other members of the City Council to get Culver City to this place. While Culver City represents a, a minority share, if you will, of the Inglewood oil fields, you will certainly have helped set a precedent um, for elected leaders at both the county and state level um, to understand really what's possible. You know, this issue for me gives me, it, it ebbs and flows, you have highs and lows. I was so proud a couple weeks ago when Governor Newsom um, announced his um, um, pledge to have us all in electric vehicles by 2035, I think it is, and his, his, his invitation to the legislature to bring forward legislation with regard to fracturing. I thought, once again, I'm 
a day late, the dollar short. I needed him 10 years ago. Uh, and needless to say, I've had co colleagues clamoring to talk to me about seeing the language of my bill. Members are clamoring. And I have to say that's a far cry from 10 years ago when I couldn't even get co-authors. I couldn't even get the bill off the floor of the House of Origin. So it's a new day um, in terms of, I think, uh, legislative interest and support in this administration. Now, today's LA Times sent me back on, again, this roller coaster. I hope you all read the article in today's Times where um, there are members of the legislature expressing their support there are people who are suggesting the governor could have taken the action through executive order and wondering why he didn't. There are members of the legislature and labor leaders who are expressing grave concern about this proposed direction and wondering if uh, it was a matter of showmanship for the governor to, to get a bump, to appear uh, that he's a climate change leader, or if it's real. So that was just a reminder to me that we still have lots of work to do. Uh, we will all collectively, the Sierra um, Club and others will continue to have to make sure that you're working very closely with your elected leaders at every level of government to help us manage our way to the kind of vision that Culver City has already um, arrived at. We have lots of work to do. Uh, I appreciate um, uh, my councilwoman acknowledging uh, the uh, campaign that I am engaged in. I'm not gonna talk um, much about that since I'm sitting in the Capitol building. Just suffice it to say uh, that I think we have an opportunity uh, with new leadership, uh, at perhaps at the, at the county level, it will, be new, it will be new leadership, whatever the outcome of the election, um, to really begin to move the needle forward. Uh, to address the long-standing fears and concerns that residents um, have tried to communicate uh, who live in dangerously close proximity to Inglewood. You know, and as a senator representing the 30th district, I have to say it's, it's Inglewood, but it's also, you know, Jefferson Park and Wes Adams. And this whole understanding around the realities of an urban oil field. You know, my colleagues who represent Kern and other rural areas just don't have a full appreciation that we do about residents, whole communities, children growing up within a stone's throw distance um, of an active oil well. And not just one, but an entire field, um, acres upon acres upon acres. And so it, it's a public education campaign, but again, like I said, I think we are so far from where we were 10 years ago in terms of public interest, in, in terms of organizing, and now having Culver City truly leading the way in a most progressive, aggressive action that is taken. So as always, I'm thrilled. It has been my honor to represent the residents of Culver City now for 10 years. And please know that um, wherever I am, you will continue to have not an ally, but an accomplice in this effort around true environmental justice. You know, and, and I'll just add very briefly um, in the last, well, you know, since I've been in office, you know, looking at there are certain areas of our community um, that are disproportionately impacted and, and the brown fields that exist in areas of the county, you know, water quality in areas of the county, we all have to do a better job uh, in terms of having, having these broad conversations about not only Inglewood and how it impacts those of us who live there, but the issues around Biona, the issues around the brownfields in Watts Willowbrook, the issues around water quality uh, in Watts Willowbrook Compton. Those are pressing issues that a county the size of LA um, the, the, with the power that they yield, uh, residents shouldn't have to contend with. And um, with that, you have a partner. They just gaveled down on my hearing, so I'm going to have to sign off. David, thank you for your fearless leadership. Megan, thank you always. And I appreciate being invited to participate briefly in today's Zoom. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your taking the time and for your leadership. Thank you. Fantastic.
All right, that was great. Um, well, so so uh, wonderful to have um, Senator Mitchell part of the conversation. Um, we're we're going to um, uh, actually uh, allow the senator to expand on some of her comments um, by showing a clip, a short clip from a forum that she participated in earlier this year with Assembly Member Sydney Kamlager. Uh, who represents Culver City and Culver City City Council member Daniel Lee, in which the senator talks about what courage looks like to make change possible by really, really highlighting two key factors uh, that, that allow change to happen, which are uh, jobs and health equity as themes. So go ahead, let's, let's hear the clip. It really looks like and 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 who who um and, and and the three of us as electeds are are activist policymakers quite frankly we come from activist roots and and that's what encouraged the three of us to run for office and so it's making sure that sierra club and all of the environmental justice organizations understand the lane you're in and the role you play in terms of pushing policy and in listening to you councilman it made me pull up the list of opposition um, to the two bills that I introduced, just to give us a frame of reference. And so when the California Chamber of Commerce calls a, a bill a job killer in this current climate and environment that we're currently in, and, and what will, which will be exacerbated as we find ourselves trying to rebuild as a result of COVID-19, we have to be clear about, about who, who we're fighting, quite frankly. And it's not just Western States Petroleum Association and all the usual suspects, but it's the California State Pipe Trades Council. It's people who, you know, uh, California Small Business Alliance. It's others who are engaged in the, in the conversation around jobs and employment. And so we have to help that community also see the light. So that's, uh, you know, another community that we're not going to fight against when we're trying to make sure that um, people have the right to breathe clean air and live healthily in their own community. Finally, I just say, you know, what strikes me as, as we spend so much of our time talking about COVID, uh, the Assemblywoman and I were on a Black Caucus call yesterday with the governor who shared with us devastating statistics in terms of the number of African-American fatalities as a result of COVID. And what struck us was not only the number, that it's a disproportionate high rate compared to our numbers in the overall state, county, or city population, but also who within the black community. And we're all here in the high-risk population of 65 and older and those with other, you know, obvious health conditions. But for black people in California, it's 18 to 49. And when we think about um, the population that lives around Inglewood, the other oil fields that are in the 30th Senate District, when we recognize how many of them have health conditions, asthma, other respiratory conditions, because of the zip code in which they were born and live, this is yet another layer uh, that further should invigorate, invigorate our fight um, and, and brings value to um, um, this issue around environmental, economic, and health justice for all California residents. So I all right, so, so there, you, there you have it. The senator is, is making these brilliant connections between the, the topic that we've been discussing today, uh, you know, urban oil fields, and the connection to jobs, the importance of joining hands with our labor colleagues, the health and economic justice issues uh, that disproportionately impact uh, people of color because they live near the oil fields. So um, uh, our next sort of transitioning now to our next speaker, uh, Monica Embry. Uh, she's the Sierra Club's National Associate Director for the Beyond Dirty Fuels campaign. She's been working to protect our communities and public lands from oil and fracked gas and toward an, towards an economy built on clean, renewable energy. Uh, welcome, Monica. Please give our listeners your perspective on what led to this victory and the role of, of labor. 
Thank you, David. And my dearest thanks to Council Member Megan Sally Wells and Senator Mitchell for those brilliant words and incredible climate justice leadership. It is so inspiring to see what our uh, council member and Culver City leaders have accomplished here. Um, so yeah, so uh, the Sierra Club has long been engaged in work, uh, as the council member mentioned. Um, David Hockey, I want to thank you for your incredible, brilliant organizing. Uh, David has been hosting conversations in his living room before the pandemic and on Zoom since every month for a decade about issues around the Inglewood oil field, as he is also a resident directly near this urban oil production. And Sierra Club members and frontline community residents care about this, as David mentioned, for many reasons. Because of the impact on our health from asthma and cancer and premature death, we know the closer you are to exposure from toxic emissions from oil drilling, the more likely you are to get different types of illnesses and diseases. And that is backed up by numerous health studies, including two reports that were published earlier this year from California universities. We know that our climate crisis cannot handle any more extraction and burning of fossil fuels. And now is the time for our leaders to take steps to make sure we are actually stopping this extraction and production of fossil fuels and transitioning with a clean break, as we like to say, to a clean renewable energy economy. And we know that we can do this in a way that creates jobs. Exactly as the Senator mentioned, environmental regulations that protect our health and our climate are not job killers. And in fact, we can put more people to work in high road, good paying jobs to help clean up the toxic infrastructure in our backyards and make sure that we are on our way to a healthy planet and good jobs at the same time. Sierra Club has not done this alone by any means. Uh, we've been working in close partnership with many different organizations, including the Natural Resource Defense Council and the Center for Biological Diversity and many, many other environmental, environmental justice and health advocates. We have done everything from help file lawsuits to testify at community meetings, to educate the neighbors around this oil field about this important issue as ways to help make our change. And we've also been doing this work in close partnership with labor unions. Historically, the environmental movement has not always been in close collaboration with our brothers, sisters, and siblings in the labor movement. And that absolutely needs to change. And part of what makes our victory at Culver City so empowering and exciting is the way that labor unions also came on board. At that historic vote in August that Council Member Sally Wells mentioned, there was testimony from multiple labor unions, including the United Steelworkers, Local 675, and California Nurses Association. We had support from unions that represent healthcare workers like SEIU and fossil fuel workers. This is a really big deal, in part because we are seeing what it means to transition from an extractive and destructive economy based on fossil fuels to a healthy, clean, regenerative economy that can be based on clean, renewable energy. For far too long, the oil and gas executives have said a lie to all of us that claim the environment, protecting our health and protecting our climate comes at the expense of jobs. That lie is not true. And part of what we need to do as environmental advocates is build and collaborate with labor unions and the labor movement to make sure we are demanding high roads jobs clean jobs, healthy jobs for all of our workers. We must also address this with equity at the center. As many folks have mentioned, including Senator Mitchell, the disproportionate impact of urban oil drilling here in LA and definitely at the Inglewood oil field falls to black, Latino, and Asian American communities and low income households. We know that those who are facing the incredible pressures for systemic racism and systemic oppression have less resources to deal with the health, environmental, and economic harms that come from living besides oil drilling. And so we must be committed to really building this in a way that uplifts all of our communities, especially frontline communities of color and low-income families. And so from Culver City to Kern County to across the state of California, we are going to continue to lead and make sure we're building strong partnerships with labor unions, the environmental justice alliances and uh, movements, 
and make sure we can build a healthy and safe environment for all of us in a place where we can also say that Black Lives Matter and all of our communities deserve health and protection. Uh, so thank you, David. I'm excited for our Q&A and to dive into many more questions about this with our panel. All right, thank you, Monica. Um, that was great. I really appreciate your, your perspectives. Um, we are now going to begin the Q&A portion of our webinar. As a reminder to all the attendees, you can ask questions of our panelists by typing, it in, typing the question into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. So uh, for this uh, portion, uh, we're joined by uh, 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 Damon Nagami, who is a, a senior attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council, and Maya Golden Krosner, who is a senior attorney for the Center for Biological Diversity. Thanks for joining us, uh, Damon and Maya. So, um, our, our first question is for Councilmember Solly Wells. Um, why did Culver City decide to lead on this, and 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 how has your direction? Uh, changed over time. You've, you've touched on that before, but but please expand. Uh, we really love to, to hear your perspective. Um, um, and you're, you're on mute right now. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, I mean, really, we led from necessity. <laughs> you know, several years ago, I think it was maybe around 2003, maybe a little earlier, um, there were some like big toxic releases, like a couple of them in a row. And um, a, a whole neighborhood basically voluntarily evacuated. People were getting nosebleeds. They were nauseous, you know, um, really the signs that something wrong had gone on. And um, the city at the time, you know, looked to the oil operator and said, you know, dude, what's up? <laughs> And they're like, nah. <laughs> they were very non-responsive and, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll take care of it. And uh, no, nothing, nothing very reassuring for a community. And the, the city then went to um, the county and said, hey, county, what's up with the oil? You know, what's happening on the oil field? And they're like, uh, you know, you should look to the state state okay what's happening and the the state says well you look to the county <laughs> and lo and behold <laughs> we found the hard way that nobody was in charge and nobody was paying attention to the largest urban oil field in the united states and you know that's concerning um and so thus thus began a long journey <laughs> towards finding some accountability and and making sure that this wouldn't happen again and um, you know, through this process, uh, Culver City initially started working with LA County to create um, you know regulations for the field where there were there was basically like a hot I don't know it looked like a handshake and a wink right <laughs> that <was>, was <laughs> the regulations in place at the time, um, and uh, the and unfortunately the county and the city you know found that you know the county was looking for. Uh, regulations that were a lot more relaxed than what the city was expecting and, and asking for. And actually with uh, Damon and the NRDC and other community groups, we ended up suing and, and, and won one case and another case um, had a settlement agreement. Um, but, uh, it, you know, we, we went to bat against both the county and uh, the oil field to insist on uh, better, stronger regulations. And, and that's where this kind of original split happened uh, that we've been working on ever since. So that's how we started. And then as I explained earlier, you know, we've, we had this aha moment <laughs> where we were going for like better regulations to like, you know, maybe oil drilling is not such a good idea. <laughs> You know, climate change, right? All these things that, you know, 10 years ago, a lot of the, the, the things we were talking about with our concerns with climate change were really, 
you know, based in a lot of science, obviously based in science, but a lot of it was kind of like theoretical. And now as the years have gone on, we have gone through from theory to just literally being on the front lines of the climate emergency now, like faster than I had expected. And, and I was already, you know, very working hard uh, against climate change and, and for climate protection. And so, you know, that we have this just amazing sense of urgency where A, it doesn't belong here. B, we need to act fast. And then C, the jobs piece, which is, I think, gives me the most hope of all is that, you know, as a community that has 100% renewable energy today, like not in 10 years, not in 20 years, but today we are 100% renewable. Um, we also need uh, to be more resilient. We need local sources of energy. And along with, in, in my view, what would be a beautiful um, uh, outcome would be to have a uh, park and open space that is also compatible with the creation of, of uh, energy storage, which we desperately, desperately need. Um, and so there, so I think we have a win-win and then the remediation, right? I saw in the Q and A, somebody was talking about like, you know, is this going to be a super fun site, et cetera? Like hope, I hope not. Right. I hope that, um, that we can, uh, as we're remediating, we can remediate it to a degree where it becomes healthy again, where we can have open space, um, and then also provide, you know, great jobs, both in the remediation process and then in um, the, the energy storage, which, which we absolutely uh, need today. And there's a lot of economic opportunity. There's a lot of jobs opportunity. And then there's like this dream of having a community thriving instead of suffering. And I think we would all like that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. That that's fabulous uh, to to provide that uh, that vision that you've carried forward for all these years, and and uh, um, uh, I think you have a lot more partners now than you did back then. Um, so our our next question is about um, uh, for for Damon uh, Nagami. Um, uh, can you explain? Um, to us some of the history and background context for the regulations over oil drilling at the Baldwin Hills Inglewood oil field. Yeah, sure, thanks, David. And yeah, thanks uh, to everyone here for organizing and for having this conversation. It's really been uh, terrific so far. Uh, as, and I think I'm just gonna follow up a little bit on what uh, Council Member Sally Wells was talking about. I think as many of you probably know, one of the reasons what Culver City is doing is so important is that it really sets a tone and a precedent for what can be done on the rest of the Inglewood oil field. Uh, as has been said before, you know, the Culver City portion of the field is about 10%, maybe 88 acres, while the unincorporated county portion of the field is the other 90%. And what I think we want to remember here is, you know, if Culver City can do it, then so can the county. And just with sort of like a little background on um, what's happened previously, you know, the county portion of the oil field is governed by a zoning overlay known as the Baldwin Hills Community Standards District. And this was the first attempt at regulating the oil field from a land use perspective, and that was back in 2008. And it was prompted by exactly what Councilmember Sally Wells was talking about, which was a couple of uh, noxious gas releases that happened in Culver City that made folks sick, caused folks to go to the hospital, and really uh, created some alarm in the community that eventually got back to our elected leaders. That uh, CSD, the Community Standards District, it had some community protections, but not enough, which led to the litigation. And, um, uh, you know, NRDC sued along with our partners at the City of Culver City, uh, Community Health Councils, the City Project, uh, Concerned Citizens of South Central, and Coalition for a Safe Community, we were able to actually achieve uh, some additional protections through settlement in 2011. We got a uh, reduction in the number of wells that were allowed. We incentivized uh, the closing of some wells near the perimeter of the, well, of the field. But I think everyone understands, even then, but now certainly, that that was a compromise. And, and that was nine years ago. So 
as council member Sally Wells has said, so much has changed and that's why it's so important to have champions like uh, Culver City taking these bold steps uh, moving forward in terms of phasing out wells on the Culver City portion of the field. I, it's no secret that the oil industry has significant resources and influence. And this means in the real world that change has been slow going. And so to set an example to show the county uh, how to try to, for example, improve the CSD in the short term, but then take similar bold steps in terms of a phase out, either when the CSD eventually expires, which is in eight years, or hopefully sooner than that, if we can accelerate the timetable. I can't emphasize enough how important it is in the larger picture for there to be this model, this precedent, this uh, uh, shining example of what can happen at an urban oil field. And that's what, to me, makes uh, what Culver City is doing so exciting. Thank you, Damon. Uh, great to have that perspective and, and uh, under, better understand the impacts of, of what Culver City is doing. Uh, our next question is from Maya Golden Krasner. Um, what else is happening across LA City and the County of Los Angeles with, with regards to oil drilling regulations? Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, David, and thanks everybody. And um, you know, I think this is a perfect follow-up to Damon's response because, as Damon put it, change has been slow going, um, and Culver City is really showing what needs to be done across the state to save our residents, our planet, and our economy. So for example, um, at the city level in LA City, um, a coalition of environmental justice and community-based organizations, people who live near well sites, particularly in South LA, um, they've been trying to get the city to pass a 2,500 foot health and safety buffer between drilling and homes and schools and parks um, and the city has just hemmed and hawed and ordered more studies and more studies for years and years. Um, these wells are basically in people's backyards, especially in South LA and Wilmington, they have very few safeguards. But science tells us, as people have already said today, that even with safety measures and safeguards, wells don't belong near homes um, and schools. So we sincerely hope that the city of LA takes notice of what's happening here in Culver City and what can be done and it spurs them forward. The LA County is faring no better right now and potentially even worse. Um, they released a proposed ordinance recently that would have created a 500 foot buffer only for new wells, but allow existing wells and other new wells to get permits to operate for at least 20 years. Now in 20 years, the state is supposed to be carbon neutral and we're no longer gonna be selling fossil fuel vehicles. So after activists pointed out that Culver City's proposal, uh, uh, well, activists pointed out what's going on in Culver City and what Culver City's done, and then pointed out many of the serious flaws in this completely absurd proposal by the county, now the county is going back to the drawing board and coming up with new regulations that really hopefully will take a bold action like Culver City's done. And finally, you know, at the state level, again, things are just moving really slowly. The legislature this year refused to pass a bill that was supported by environmental justice and environmental groups that would have required oil regulators to study a 2,500 foot buffer. Now those regulators known as CalGEM are now undertaking a rulemaking process to study the potential safety regulations for oil and gas. But the process is grindingly slow and we really aren't sure what's under consideration at the state level now. So I think what this shows is how it just truly important actions like these by Culver City are to show all of these other entities what must be and can be done to protect people and provide good jobs. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Um, we, we really understand that there's, there's so many different people working on this from different perspectives and 
and, and so that's why Culver City's leadership is so important. Our, our next question um, is for Monica. Um, you know, we've, we've heard that there's a lot of support from different sectors for this motion. Can you speak to why labor was so strongly in favor of Culver City's decision? Absolutely. Um, and I'll answer some of the questions I'm seeing come up in the chat as I as I do this as well. Um, so this was a long standing fight that for many, many years, many organizations have led on. So I really want to thank NRDC and the Center for Biological Diversity for being incredible partners and leaders in this work. It's been a big joint effort from many organizations. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the effort that we most recently won with incredible leadership from uh, council member Sally Wells and others it was really a, a joint effort and for a couple of reasons. So labor unions were willing to take a stand in supporting of this amortization motion uh, for a few reasons. First, because of the incredible leadership uh, by council member Megan Sally Wells, council member Daniel Lee, council member Alex Fish and others to make sure that the cleanup and remediation of the oil field was part of what was in the discussion. And so when we talk about just transition, uh, part of what we're talking about is as we have the managed decline off of fossil fuel production, making sure that those people who work in the fossil fuel industry are equitably and justly transitioned. Part of what that can look like is actually having fossil fuel workers be put to work to clean up wells once they're shut down or to clean up non-active, non-producing, what we call idle wells. And a significant number of the wells at the Inglewood oil field right now, which to answer Rita's question has one operator called Sentinel Peak Resources, though it's had many operators and changed hands many times over the century of drilling. It's current single operator Sentinel Peak Resources, significant portion of those wells aren't active. And if it's not active, that means there are not a significant number of people working at them. And instead, we could put fossil fuel workers to work to clean up those wells, to pour cement down the casings, remove the toxic infrastructure, and clean up the soil. And answer Vivian's question of the plan we want afterwards, Council Member Sally Wells said it best, right? The other big reason that labor unions joined us is the potential for jobs once we transform these sites to green sites, not brownfields. After that toxic infrastructure is removed, whatever communities dream up is what we can have in our backyard. Already, there are calls and efforts to turn Kenneth Hahn State Park into the Central Park of the West, a beautiful, huge park that would allow access, especially to the African American and Latino community and residents that live around it. It could provide incredible opportunities to connect um, from the park to Playa Trail, right, to bring together parts of our community that often are separated because of lack of access to these public infrastructures. It could employ people in the building trades to put to work battery storage to help house the battery for that 100% clean renewable energy that's helped with keeping the lights on at Culver City. Culver City is part of the Clean Power Alliance and many other communities need storage of renewable energy. We're actually producing enough and we need somewhere to hold all of that power and so part of it is having a battery storage, which could be done with project labor agreements and good family sustaining jobs with labor unions would actually put building trades workers like IBEW to work. So, and then of course, labor unions that represent health impacts from nurses to teachers to other public sector workers really understand the ways that having hundreds of people come into the ER with asthma attacks and chronic breathing issues is taxing our system especially in this current moment with the pandemic, we need to be taking care of people's health. And so unions that represent healthcare workers that are already stretched way too thin facing the pandemic understand the needs for us to clean up our air, our water, and our land to protect all of our communities. So different labor unions came on board for different reasons, from cleaning up the wells, to the battery storage, to the parks, to the healthcare, depending what a labor union represents, often is part of what brought them on board, and we're really excited about continuing to partner with them in the many months and years to come as we accomplish this incredible vision. Thanks, David. Thanks, and, and it's so important to understand. Uh, thank you, Monica, for explaining you know, why the labor piece, the jobs piece really makes sense here. So um, 
We're gonna be closing out the hour with a call to action and what people can do. But before we get there, uh, we have another question. Um, uh, and this one for Maya and Damon, um, you know, is, is what Sierra, is what Culver City doing actually legal? Um, and, and, you know, what about the takings claims that, that a lot of uh, royalty owners are, are, are talking about? And, and you know, you know what's, what's the legal basis for this? And, and uh, you know, why, why can uh, Culver City actually do this? Yeah, I can start, um, take that, thanks, David. Um, you know, I'm just gonna say it, Culver City is brave because we know that the oil industry is litigious and they are likely to sue no matter how much this action is within the city's rights. And make no mistake, it is very much within the city's authority, what's called their police power authority that I think Megan alluded to earlier, to enact laws that protect their residents. I saw a question in the Q&A about eminent domain and could they do use eminent domain? I mean, yes, but it would be expensive and it's not necessary here. There's a long line of cases that upholds the right of local governments to enact prohibitions on drilling in urban areas to protect public health, safety, and welfare of people nearby. So one of the arguments that oil companies sometimes bring up or almost always bring up is that they have a permit which gives them the right to drill. But there's one, no right to create a nuisance. And two, even if it's not a nuisance, these rights are only as good as the terms of their permit. Permit runs out, right is expired. And third, any of these rights can be terminated after a reasonable phase out or amortization period. And this period is the, the period that Megan mentioned, the return on investment that gives the operator time to recoup their original investment. So that's what Culver City hired Baker, Baker and O'Brien to figure out. And it appears here that Sentinel will have recouped its investment by early next year. So really it's time to start transitioning now to a healthier climate protective jobs creating use. And now you had also mentioned David, um, another, another legal argument that oil companies bring up, which is takings, and I'll let Damon cover that if, if he wants. Sure, yeah, thanks Maya. And uh, agree with everything Maya just said, and just to keep it short, uh, takings often comes up because it's part of the oil industry playbook. I think a lot of polluters will try to use scare tactics and say that takings are an issue uh, we're just here to say that Culver City's approach takes both vested rights and takings into account. Yes, the U.S. and California constitutions prohibit the government from taking property for private property for public use without just uh, compensation. But as Maya said, the government can regulate the use of property. And when you do that, a taking only results in very narrow circumstances. Uh, there is longstanding case law that lays out exactly um, what the contours are of takings. And land use regulations just don't result in a taking just because property owners or businesses would be affected financially. Um, they can kick and scream about having an impact to their, their bottom line. But in the end, the Supreme Court has held that a regulatory taking can only be found where the regulation is so extreme that it's the functional equivalent of eminent domain. And that's not anything like what we're talking about here. We've done the legal research. We're confident there are no takings here, in part because of this amortization process that um, you've heard about over and over in this webinar that allows operators to basically recoup some of their investment before the wells are phased out. And if that is part of the plan, then you're good to go. And that's it. I see that we're coming up to the end of the hour. So I want to get back to David. Thanks, David. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. I uh, really appreciate that and, and uh, gives us uh, both confidence and bravery to go forward. Um, so uh, here we're at the end of the hour. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people are still on the call. Um, so, you know, it looks like we're going to do some extended Q&A after the end of the hour. But before we do, um, uh, wanted to briefly touch on, you know, what are some of the things that 
you know, average people can do uh, to, to get involved and support this. And then we'll turn it over to Ellie. Um, uh, uh, so, so Monica, do you want to briefly touch on that? Sure, and happy to stay on for another half an hour and continue. We see lots of great questions in the chat, so happy to stay here and, and keep answering all of your questions. Thanks again, uh, everyone, for joining us today. Um, so I've seen some of the chats. We've got folks from San Luis Obispo, from Kern County, Bakersfield, across LA, Long Beach, again, even Culver City. Thank you for tuning in. What is most important for all of us to do, I will say, are two actions. First, I would be remiss to not say that we are less than a month from one of the most important elections of our lifetime. So please get out the vote and make sure we vote in climate champions. Uh, it is so critical that we elect incredible leaders like Council Member Megan Sally Wells and Senator Mitchell. Once we have our champions in office, then we're able to actually pass incredible victories like the ones we are currently doing at Culver City. So please get out the vote, pay attention to your voter guides. Mail-in ballots I know are hitting LA doors this week, so really hope that you will all vote on this critical election, not just at the presidential level, but all the way down to your local races. It is so important that we get local government officials in who protect our interests. Now, second I wanna name, once we get those people into office, it's all of our jobs as their constituents to hold them accountable. So I would encourage everyone to get involved in your local community. If you have urban oil drilling or neighborhood oil drilling, make sure that you are reaching out to your city and county officials to demand strong action. If you're here with us in LA, NRDC, the Center for Biological Diversity and the Sierra Club partner together on a campaign right now to call on LA County to enact strong 2,500 foot setback for all oil drilling across LA County, not to shepherd in those new wells, as Maya had mentioned earlier. So we would love for you in LA to get involved in our local campaign. You can find out more on the Clean Break website, which is cleanbreak.info, um, and take action at sc.org slash LA oil. I'll make sure to put those in the chat. But really, no matter where you are, if you're across the state of California, our government and our state is going to be producing their statewide setback recommendation by December 31st of this year, as Newsom directed in his most recent executive order a few weeks ago. So there will be regulations in LA County and the state of California on setbacks, and your elected and appointed leaders need to hear from you. So one, get out the vote, and then two, hold your elected officials accountable. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ellie. Thank you so much, Monica, and everybody. Fantastic panel today and just incredible work. A great example for what's possible to happen in other cities and towns across California and beyond. I want to encourage everybody to think also, in addition to the great actions that Monica just shared, to also endorse Climate Safe California, to go to www.climatesafeca.org. This is a statewide effort to accelerate climate policy timelines and to accelerate the phase out of fossil fuels. We need to act at the state level as well as at the local level to do what's needed based on the rapidly worsening climate reality. And we got to start with our own backyards and our own state government. So thank you so much. Just go to climatesafeca.org and endorse today. Today we've gotten, I believe, 10 endorsements so far. We'd love for you to go visit after the rest of the Q&A. Thanks so much, and I'll hand that back to Dave. All right, fabulous. Well, um, we, we do have time for some more questions. We've gotten actually a lot of questions, and, and uh, our panelists, some of our panelists are, are able to stay on a little longer and address some of these. So again, thanks to all the attendees for participating today. For, for your support, uh, for the great questions. And, and, and here's a question from Don Maruska, um, who uh, says that uh, they have an oil field called Price Canyon in San Luis Obispo County. Um, Maya, do you think you could take this question? What, what do you see as opportunities for phasing out oil production there? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, and I, I kind of put a little thing in the chat responding to, but um, you know, Price Canyon, it's, it's county property. Um, it's also owned by Sentinel, just like um, the Inglewood oil field. They, 
we and neighbors who are living by the oil field fought against their plan to expand underground injection. Um, and unfortunately, the court ruled against us, um, which we still think is wrong. And we've worked on a ballot initiative in San Luis Obispo to try to um, ban wells and fracking. And that unfortunately didn't pass after the oil industry put in tens of millions of dollars to fight it. Um, there are a couple of uh, things that are coming up. So Sentinel has applied for an extension of its CUP to build, I think, 31 new wells. And we have a pending appeal at the Board of Supervisors. So um, if that ever comes up for hearing, we can um, get folks to support that. They are also had a plan to expand um, in a sort of phase five expansion for over 300 new wells. And if that plan ever, if they ever release the environmental view, view document, um, fighting against that would also be a way. But I think that Ultimately, as Monica said, the most important thing is to vote. Um, vote for county supervisors who are going to support efforts to phase out the, the drilling at the field. Um, we just really need to get some friendly supervisors in there and then we can start to push them to take the same actions that Culver City did. So organize, vote, and then hold your elected officials accountable. And, and if I could just jump in here, um, you know, I started as a community organizer. Like I, it was the furthest thing from my mind to ever imagine running for office. And so, I, you know, for, for those of you who, who have a knack for policy and care for your community and, and you know, feel like, the other folks who are running are horrible, <laughs> which is often the case and a good motivator. I, you know, think about it. Think about running, especially if you are, um, if you find that your, yourself, your interests and your community are not being represented. Um, you know, I'm only the fifth woman to be elected in Culver City's history, which is crazy. Um, we, we only just elected uh, uh, an, uh, an African American for the first time like two years ago. And the, the lack of attention and the lack of representation on a local level is pretty breathtakingly sad. <laughs> and so, um, so think, of, think, of, think of what you could do and who you could be as a leader. And um, I, I think the more activists and organizers that we have in elected office, the more responsive our communities are. It's definitely been the case of Culver City and I've seen it across the country um, with people who have been working with community are, are really often the best leaders because they're the ones who are listening. Thank you, Megan. Um, uh, there's actually uh, a question uh, for you here. Um, uh, one of our attendees asks, what do you see as next steps? What needs to take place for the pumps to actually be shut down? Yeah, so I mean, we're moving forward with an amortization program um, that so that's like studying, okay, how, how are we going to move from this, this study <laughs> to, to, to practice. Um, and so there's going to be, you know, more analysis put into that um, more, you know, talking to the community, talking to all of our major stakeholders, and at the same time, um, pursuing this just transition. Uh, with, um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, um, Culver City is 100% renewable. The, the reason we're 100% renewable is because we're part of the Clean Power Alliance and David is uh, one of the community advisory panel members of, of the Clean Power Alliance and I'm on the board of directors. And we have a, a tremendous need for, as I said earlier, like local energy storage and, and all of our contracts have project labor agreements. <laughs> and so, you know, at the same time that we're looking at the phase, like 
literally phasing them out and the the mechanics of that you know when where how these are the things that we're looking at right now um the other thing we need to be looking at is like okay then what what's what it, what is in its place and um you know working working with our labor partners to make sure that there are good union jobs in um, remediating uh, the the existing, you know, 100 year old infrastructure, that's going to take a lot of work, it's going to take time. Um, and so, uh, and, and the reason why we have, um, you know, the, the steel workers at the table, it's very rare to have steel workers at the table supporting a just transition. It's happening more and more now, but what they're seeing is that a lot of the oil and gas companies are breaking their contracts and breaking their promises. You know, the, the, their retirement, their pension funds are pretty much being decimated right now. And so there have been a lot of broken promises on behalf of the, the oil industry and they, we want them at the table and they need to be at the table in order to ensure that as we take these next steps to, to, to phase out a finite resource, by the way, it's going away no matter what, <laughs> um, that we do it in a way that really respects, that provides good jobs, that makes sure that they're at the table and not on the menu are the workers and um, that, that there are good um, project labor agreements so that um, we do it in a responsible way. This is dangerous work. It is dangerous work. And we need to pay as much attention to the, the health of our workers as we do um, the health of the rest of our community members. And you can't do that without union labor. I mean, the thing about the Englewood oil field, it's not unionized. Um, and, and as a matter, you know, they haven't been drilling new wells for, for the past several years. And so they've got, you know, this is the largest urban, urban oil field in the United States. They've got like 80 permanent workers, 80 full-time non-union workers. Um, so what that represents in terms of labor in Culver City is relatively small. Um, we, we certainly want to work with them on the next steps and the just transition. Um, but it's not like the, the, <laughs> there's very little money <laughs> that comes from the oil field into the Culver City coffers, you know? <laughs> and so the, we, we've got a lot of opportunity to do better and, um, and have something that is long lasting and not finite, right? <laughs> that is healthy, <laughs> that has good jobs, that doesn't break its promises. So a lot of opportunity. Thank you, uh, council member. That was a great transition or set up to, to our next question, which comes from attendee Jen Simmons. Um, and I'll let uh, Monica start this one and then Damon uh, uh, also respond. Uh, the question is, how do you convince oil and gas workers to transition to renewable energy? What is the vision of the park that will replace the oil field? Great, I'm happy to take the, that worker question. Maybe Damon, I know you've done work on that park vision. Um, this is a great question, right? And exactly actually what the council member Sally Wells was just speaking to. Many, many oil and gas workers are non-union labor. And nonetheless, they have prevailing wages. They are well compensated jobs that have workplace uh, safety measures, that have health care, that have benefits that many people in the trades deserve. Um, you know, at Sierra Club, we do believe that all labor, all work has dignity. And so when we think about what does it mean to transition, we need to make sure um, that all of the work we're asking someone to transition into meets those same standards of what's often called high road family sustaining jobs. Um, a critique that I've heard from labor union leaders in conversations I've had with them is that sometimes it seems like environmentalists are asking that they leave a well compensated job in the oil industry to go get paid minimum wage to install solar panels far from their homes. That is not an acceptable transition. We need to make sure that our renewable energy jobs pay prevailing wages, 
come with packaged benefits like health care and pensions and are meeting the needs so that workers can support their families. Regardless of what someone's background is, whether it's a blue collar job or white collar job, everyone deserves the ability to feed their families and take care of their homes. And so part of what we need to do as environmentalists is make sure that the renewable energy sector is actually getting unionized and making sure that as we transition, that it is a just one. As uh, council members shared, the end of oil is inevitable. We are seeing companies go bankrupt week after week at this point across the country. Folks might know that the largest oil and gas operator here in California, California Resource Resources Corporation has filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy, right? And is currently in court uh, restructuring its organization. And that's the largest oil and gas operator here, right? In the state. So they, we are seeing the end of oil. We are going to transition. Just as we went from uh, landlines to cell phones, the change is inevitable. Now what's not inevitable is how that change happens and if it will be equitable and just. And that is our responsibility. I say that very strongly as Sierra Club and as a larger environmental movement, it is our responsibility to make sure we are calling for this transition to be equitable and just, that those workers are not left behind because we know far too often what happens where the CEOs get bailed out and the rest of those workers get left behind. And that's not the transition that we need. We don't need to ha what happened at the coal industry across Appalachia, often what's called an unmanaged decline. We need to make sure that those people who have been working for decades in a very dangerous industry that has kept our lights on, that has kept our cars running, are compensated in this transition. So there's a lot of things that we need to do. Part of that is job training. Part of that is early retirement. Part of that is fighting to make sure the renewable energy system we're building is unionized. And part of it is also recognizing it doesn't need to be an oil worker goes to a solar field. People who are pipe fitters, who lay groundwork for pipes to pump oil, have the skill set to make sure that our water infrastructure is updated and make sure that we can replace toxic lead pipes right, that are all across our communities. Often these jobs are transferable in different sectors. So people don't necessarily need to stay also within the energy sector. And so when we call for a just transition, it's to make sure that all jobs, regardless of sector, are fairly compensated, high road, family sustaining jobs that we prefer would be in unions because we know unions make us strong. And with that, maybe I'll hand it to Damon to talk a little bit about the park transition. Yeah, absolutely. And Thank you, Monica. Echo everything you said on Just Transition. So proud to have you as a partner. Um, yeah, moving, that's a great question that, about the vision for the field. And, you know, my, my first thought is there's already a document out there that has a community vision in it. It's called the Baldwin Hills Park Master Plan. And I encourage folks to take a look at it. When Council Member Sally Wells talks about uh, converting the oil field to the Central Park of the West, that's what the community had in mind. Uh, back in the 1990s, I think folks saw that uh, production was declining in this field and uh, they wanted to start to take steps and do some planning and think about what's next. And the result was a comprehensive plan that had lots of input and uh, that laid out uh, this vision for a park with um, beautiful renderings and, and Put, folks put a lot of work into this. Um, now, as we, you know, a theme here today is, you know, the oil industry has a lot of influence and is persistent and they have come up with ways to extend the life of oil fields. They've come up with fracking and enhanced oil recovery and all kinds of other methods to get at that hard to reach oil that folks thought, uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, obtain, to, to reach in the past. So they've essentially extended the life of oil fields and they're trying to do that here. Um, but we know where that's going to lead. We know that's going to lead to a future that uh, we don't want and the impacts of climate change and fossil fuels are, uh, we're seeing those now. And so I think we, we understand that we need to go in a very different direction. I think the Baldwin Hills Master Plan can serve as a guidepost for uh, what we want to see and what the community wants to see here at the oil field. It certainly needs to be updated. It was 2002. And so one of the first things that needs, that needs to happen is uh, communities 
around the oil field that are being impacted by the field now need to have a say in what happens going forward. So there needs to be community outreach to uh, folks in Culver City, and the council, city council has uh, been doing that, and that's fantastic. There are other neighborhoods, lots of neighborhoods that are impacted. Baldwin Hills, Ladera Heights, Crenshaw, Blair Hills. There are um, folks that need, you know we need to talk to that that can raise their voice and say what they want the future of this field to be. And um, I think Monica made a referen reference to it before. Uh, black and brown communities are the ones that have received the short end of the stick for decades with underinvestment in their communities, racial prejudice, uh, impacting policies such as redlining and others. Um, they're the ones that we need to reach out to and make sure that this just transition is working for them. So that's high on my priority list. Uh, but this vision is going to be something that I think we all figure out together. And you know, a big park, if it's uh, some uh, renewable energy, if it's some, you know, affordable housing, there are all kinds of uh, community serving amenities that uh, can be in the mix here. And um, I, I think it has to have buy in from the community. And I'm really looking forward to having that conversation move forward. And I think there are lots of folks on this call today that uh, are going to be part of that. So it's very exciting. Thank you, Damon. Um, yeah, so um, there, there are other attendees who who are asking questions about the, you know, uh, how could this uh, vision of, of a great park become a reality? Um, you know, what, what do they need to do? You've already talked about community outreach. Um, uh, you know, we've already heard about electing supervisors that share this vision. Um, you know, uh, what about the, the, the cost of buying uh, the land from the owners? Um, you know, uh, are, there, are there ways of, of, you know, creating, you know, you know the money or, or freeing up the money to actually make those kind of purchases on behalf of the, of the, the state, the county, et cetera? Uh, Megan, you, you raised your hand. Yeah. Um, well, we're really lucky because we we actually have a state agency that is that's purpose is to convert oil the oil field into parkland. It's the Baldwin Hills Conservancy, and it's been there for at least ten years. Damon, you probably know the exact uh, date that it began, but. Um, it, it, it dates back for sure. And they, they've been, they've already um, converted uh, uh, abandoned oil field segments and turned it into parkland. Um, they're working, I mean, if, if you're, if any of you are familiar with this area, this is like along the La Cienega Highway that often people will take to LAX. And you go through this weird, like you're in the neighborhood and then all of a sudden you're <laughs> driving through a hellscape, <laughs> an industrial hellscape. And then there's this amazing park, the Kenneth Hahn Park that's right there. And there's been, you know, extraordinary efforts on behalf of LA County um, with the partnership of the Baldwin Hills Conservancy to make more parkland because what we're really lacking in this area in Los Angeles is parkland for the amount of, you know, the population that we have. We need that open space. We know that, that our health depends on open space and recreation space as well. And so um, the, they're, they're just finishing up a bridge to link um, the Stone, Stone View Nature Center that's um, actually in the city of Culver City, but it's a county park um, on one side of La Cienega and, and just connecting it to uh, Kenneth Hahn. And so the Baldwin Hills Conservancy is there. It is their job, <laughs> their mandate. And they actually do have um, some funding uh, to, to convert, um, to make this, this transition. And so um, it's taken a really long time, and you know, my I, I I find it's my job to accelerate that and make sure that it's happening um, more quickly, so that so that all of our residents can benefit. Also, you know, in this in this kind of um, frame of environmental justice, 
Um, I think as we're working with communities, we also have to be really mindful of, you know, as we're making these improvements and converting the oil into parkland and other beneficial uses, um, that we're not uh, displacing existing communities of color <laughs> that live in this neighborhood. Um, in the community advisory panel for um, the, the oil field, we had a recent presentation on um, environmental justice and um, kind of like the history of redlining in Los Angeles. And you often see land use patterns where the worst possible industrial practices are in the poorest communities. Um, but then let's not forget that when we transition off of oil, that we not displace our existing communities, our existing residents. And so that's another piece that for those of you in different cities with different oil fields, looking at the future and how you can make it better. Um, if you are not consulting with the community, you are doing it wrong. Um, and you need to make sure you have protections for um, especially renters um, and, and policies in place to avoid displacement because that would be a tragedy and it would be wrong. And so, you know, when we're in this early thinking, now is the time to really center that and, and make sure, making sure that that's what you pursue. It's definitely um, what I'm looking toward. You see it with the LA River these issues, you see it, you see it all over. And so we, we know the pattern and now we know to avoid it. <laughs> Great answer, thank you, um, Megan, that was really helpful. Um, we're gonna go to uh, one last uh, question from our attendees. Um, and uh, this one is for uh, uh, Maya and Megan. Um, and again, touches on this whole issue of, you know, where does the money come from? Um, Who's going to pay? Uh, this one, this question is for Mike Moore. Who's going to pay for remediation of the Culver City oil fields? Um, maybe um, and Megan, you can help with uh, help us with this one as well. Um, uh, you know, is 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 there some kind of an agreement that that guides, you know, the the remediation costs and and how to pay for it? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, what we've seen over and over again in the state is usually it's up to the taxpayer to pay it because as as these companies go bankrupt, <laughs> they live, leave us with the bill. <laughs> and so I think there's a big, there's a lot of, uh, I think we're being very mindful of making sure that if you're creating the problem, you're also cleaning it up. Um, obviously, we have a lot of details to to work out but thankfully there are laws and we fully intend for <laughs> every business to follow the laws in place and um and i i think i'll leave it to maya who has more like the statewide perspective on that but um we we want to make sure that um that that things are being done fairly and and according to law yeah, uh, thank you, Megan. And we agree, um, you know, we have a principal polluter pays. We want to make sure that the polluter pays here. There are state laws that require that the polluter cleans up. They have to properly not only, um, you know, stop drilling, but they have to properly abandon their wells and they have to clean up the pollution that they've created. So, you know, as long as the company hasn't declared bankruptcy, that's the system that's currently in place. And we don't, what we really don't wanna see is for taxpayers to have to foot this bill. Um, and so, you know, it also, fortunately, the process of remediating wells and capping them so that they don't create more pollution also can create jobs. And so we also wanna see that, that the, the, these jobs are, um, you know, high road jobs that Monica described as well, so. And, and I'll add one more layer to it because I, you know, it's my job to think long-term in the interest of my community long-term. And, you know, if you're just thinking of, of the budget, um, 
can we really afford to continue extracting oil knowing what it does to the environment? I mean, the cost of the wildfires, you know, every year, um, every year oh, we're gosh. breaking records, the, the health costs. I mean, the history of polluting industries is uh, uh, the history of externalizing costs. And, you know, for far too long, the narrative has been, well, you know, you can't afford not to do this. We've got the jobs. We're, you know, it's bad for the economy to stop this business. Sorry, no, it's the opposite. We can't afford to continue along this destructive path that is already here. This is not a drill. We cannot afford it, not just in terms of our own health and survival as a species, but like just the healthcare costs alone are just like how, de how deeply unfair and, and how shallow is that thinking? And I think that's like, I, I think we need, that's why I'm glad we're leading with an economic study, right? <laughs> the, the money is on the side of the environment. The money is on the side of the people. And it is no longer a choice of, you know, jobs or environment. You, you have no jobs when you're on fire. Give me a break, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and we have even better jobs, sustainable jobs, and jobs that respect the workers as we're building up the resiliency, the recovery um, that, that we need right now. So I, I'm, you know, let's just turn that page and let's change the narrative because it's completely wrongheaded and false. I don't have any feelings about this. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was so eloquent and so well said. Uh, I love. I, you know, we need to take those words and and somehow put them on Culver City City Hall and remember them. So thank you. Um, uh, we're going to close out now. This has been a, a wonderful webinar. Uh, great questions and and wonderful panel and and uh, conversation discussion. Uh, but of course, there's so many things left to do and next steps. So to, to close things out here, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Monica to, to, to help us understand, you know, what is our final call to action here? Sure, David. And I just want to send my deepest thanks uh, to Ellie and the entire team at the Climate Center. Thank you to our elected leaders, Councilwoman Megan Sally Wells and Senator Mitchell. Thank you to our partners, Damon NRDC and Maya with the Center for Biological Diversity Action Fund for all of your partnership and leadership. And David, as Sierra Club are our members, thank you for being a decade plus long leader and volunteer with Sierra Club and helping champion and lead our work on Culver City. I've loved today's conversation. So thank you everyone. Um, and exactly as Councilman Megan Sally Wells said, there are no good jobs on a dead planet, right? And we now understand the true impact that a health crisis can have on our economy. And so as we meet our climate, our health, and our economic needs together, I'm so excited to keep building. So as a final reminder, your call to actions are vote, up and down your ballot, do your research, figure out who your local elected officials are, and then organize. Day after the election, we need to get to work to hold whoever becomes our new leaders accountable to meet the, the demands of our time. And that includes making bold climate leadership that actually meets the crisis, that protects our health and safety, and provides a just recovery and strong economy for all of us. And so thank you for that. If you don't have strong elected officials elected this round, the good news is we still have a democracy. We need to make sure we get them elected the next time. So keep organizing with your neighbors. Let's keep building. We are stronger together. And thank you, Culver City. Thank you for leading the way in saying no to oil and yes to jobs, yes to climate, and yes to our health. What a wonderful day to celebrate and so excited to celebrate with all of you. Thank you so much. We'll send out the recording soon. Take care. All right. Perfect ending. Thank you.